Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. May we pray together. Lord, now as we open up this portion of Scripture together, we ask once again that you will give us attentive hearts, engaged minds. And Father, we, simply, we, we do not simply want to be hearers of the word today. Help us, Lord, to be doers of it. That we would not just be recipient of your truth, but may we be obedient to your truth. That it might shape our thinking and shape our daily lives for your glory and your honor. Thank you for this inspired and authoritative section of your word. And we pray now, Lord, that it will be profitable in our time of study together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, is long, complicated, and puzzling. Now, those are not the three points to my sermon. Don't get worried. That would be an odd kind of sermon to preach. But I think it's important to admit that up front. I hope some of you read along as we encourage in the bulletin in preparation for the Sunday sermon. And if you did read along this week, you may have found yourself at a few times scratching your head, wondering, what does all of this mean? It's, it's a puzzling beginning to a book and the reason it's puzzling is because if you think about it paul is mainly doing what he's mainly introducing himself and introducing his ministry you say what's puzzling about that well look at verse four who's he writing to to titus one of his students one of his protégés arguably one of his closest friends in ministry I mean, what, what Paul does here for Titus would be like if tomorrow morning I saw my son and said, Good morning, Sam. My name is Tyler. I'm a 36-year-old father of six. I like Mexican food and preaching. And he would say, What is wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you telling me that? I, I know all of that about you. I'm, I'm familiar with who you are. Like, oh, why are you... What? Paul and Titus know each other. Don't you think Titus knows who he is and knows what he does for a living? So why is it that Paul's second shortest letter contains his second longest introduction? Well, we have to dig deeply to find the answer to that question. As I said, this passage is long and complicated. In most English translations, as it is in the Greek, basically what you have here is one ginormous sentence. If you had written a sentence like this in English class in high school, you would have been failed. It has got prepositional phase upon prepositional phrase, and there, it's a compounding ideas, and it's just long and wordy. In fact, I find it funny how even the commentators admit this. This is an exact quote from a commentary in my office. It says, quote, The relationship between the various clauses in this passage is somewhat obscure because of the dense concentration of thought which is a sophisticated way of saying, I'm confused too. <laughs> Let's be honest. Now, but before we dig into everything that's here, I, I want to just even point out a lesson even in this fact. Let's remember something today. The Bible is simple, but it is not simplistic. And in a few places, it is incredibly dense. And do you know what that means? It means that Bible reading alone is insufficient. 
Bible reading should often lead us into Bible study where we need to be good Bereans. See, it's tempting to come to something like this and go, I don't know what he's saying, and just gloss over it, and just go past it, and get onto the stuff that we we feel like we do understand. But my point is, lazy Bible reading will produce lazy Christians. And if God took the time to pack all of this truth in here, should we not take the time to carefully unpack the truth in here so if you haven't had your coffee i apologize but you have to put on your thinking caps and we have to go through this carefully phrase by phrase line by line to understand all that god has packed into this beautiful introduction here so let's do that together now let's start with the easy part right in its simplest form these opening verses here these first four verses are a greeting They're an introduction. At the heading of my Bible, it uses the word salutation. Basically, what you have here in in Titus 1, 1 through 4 is like a tag on a Christmas gift. In its simplest form, what it says is, from Paul to Titus. Right? Like, it's easy to get lost in all that's here and to forget that. Verse 1, Paul, and then imagine, look what it says, dot, 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 verse 4, to Titus. Now, last week we looked at Paul, and last week we looked at Titus, so I think we get the from part, and we get the to part. Like, we understand that. The challenge comes in the dot, dot, dot. But it's in this, it's between the Paul and the Titus that God crams, and, and Paul crams into here, A very important reminder for Paul to be aware of, for Titus to be aware of, and honestly, it is a truth that we need to be reminded of. Because in short, what you learn in this sort of dot, 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 the section in between here, is we learn that Titus' ministry is part of Paul's ministry, and that Paul's ministry is part of God's ministry. What what you learn in this little section here is that we're introduced to what Paul is doing, excuse me, to what Titus is doing by being introduced to what Paul is doing, but both what Titus is doing and what Paul is doing is happening in light of everything that God is doing. Think of it this way. Matt, you know, you've ever driven along the highway, you stop at a rest stop, you get out, stretch your legs, and in every rest stop there's somewhere on the wall a, a, a giant map of the state you're in, Right? And you look at that map and you see all these roads and lines and cities and exits and all these numbers and everything on there. And it's a bit overwhelming, especially if you're not from that state. And you look at it and somewhere on that map is going to be a little red dot and three words. What are those words? You are here, right? And the moment you find that, you go, oh, got it. It makes sense. But you've got to have both. I mean, if it's just a big map and you're not from the state, you might not quite be oriented. And, of course, a big piece of paper with a little red dot that said, you are here, would be of no help to anybody. So you need both of them together. Well, what, what Titus, excuse me, what Paul is doing here, in essence, he, he's sort of doing that very thing. He's mapping out and drawing this huge, complex map of, of God's work in our world, this grand, cosmic, eternal, sovereign plan of redemption that God is doing, and he draws the entire map so that he can say, Hey, Titus, you and I are right here. And he helps Titus to gain perspective on what they're doing in light of everything else that God is doing. And my friends, listen, as a church and as individual Christians, we need to stop sometimes and do the same thing. What you and I, what we do for God, it may seem small and insignificant, but listen, it is always part of something large and eternally significant. That is God's work. Sometimes it's hard when you're just changing diapers in the nursery to see this as important. Sometimes it's hard when you're just pulling weeds or you're teaching fidgety three-year-olds like it can be hard to see this as significant but but paul tells titus listen we got a work to do and it's a hard work and you're at crete and i'm here and we're doing this but don't forget what we're doing is one small part of everything that god is doing listen 
Even the oceans are made up of tiny little drops. And the ocean of God's redemptive work in our world is being filled by little dots, little tiny drops of what you and I do in our ministry, in our lives, in our families, in our Sunday school classes. That's what is filling up the ocean of God's plan. So what appears here to be an introduction of Paul's work and Titus' work, I'm arguing, is actually an introduction of God's work. Because the Cretans, the church here, had lost sight of this. And Paul is bringing them back, even in the first few words, pushing back and saying, listen, what Titus is coming to do, he's not an inconvenience to you. He is coming on my authority, and I come on God's authority, and together we are accomplishing God's plan, so you need to listen. And Forest Baptist Church, if we're going to be a good church that is shaped by the good news, we must first understand who our good God is and what He is doing in our world. And make sure that what we're doing lines up under what he's doing. And this introduction provides an insight into all that God, much of what God is doing. So in these opening verses here, again, it's, it's really one long sentence. And you're going to notice in, as we go through this, my outline is going to all f- seem connected because that's the way it's written. It's one long sentence. But we're going to kind of break it down by verses and and look at it as best we can. So here's four aspects of God's work in our world. All right. The the first aspect we learn in verse one, here's what God's doing. Is that number one, we learn in verse one that God enlists servants to boost the church's devotion. Now think about this. God enlists, here's what God's doing in our world. He is enlisting servants to boost the church's devotion. So if God's doing that, I'm going to come back at the end and ask, are we doing that? Notice where I get this from, verse 1. It begins, Paul. Right after you have his name, he gives a twofold description of himself. Look at what he says here. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So this is Paul's twofold identification. He's a bond servant, he's God's servant, and he's Jesus' missionary. Now notice the first one for a moment, a bond servant of God. Now, believe it or not, that is the only time Paul calls himself that. You say, What? Really? Because we just read Romans. I thought he said that in Romans chapter one. No, no, no. He he on many occasions calls himself a bond servant of Jesus, but here he calls him specifically himself a bond servant of God. You say, why is that significant? Well, that's a very Old Testament idea. Think about it. Abraham was called God's servant. Moses was called God's servant. David was called God's servant. Isaiah predicted one that would come and suffer, and he would be what? God's servant. So so all of this, this idea of being God's servant, is a very Old Testament title. And then he adds that he's an apostle of Jesus, which, guess what, is a very New Testament title. So so where does Paul start? He starts by saying that his ministry has one foot firmly planted in the Old Testament and the other foot firmly planted in the New Testament. He's one of God's servants in the line of Abraham and Moses and David and so forth. That's the line he's serving in. But he's also understanding the gospel that we've been sent out by Christ. So he's that missionary who's sent as an apostle. By the way, we also see that Paul's ministry here is characterized by humility. He's a slave and authority. He's an apostle. The world doesn't think those two can go together, but God says they can. You can have authority and have humility. Many people in our world do not, unfortunately. But Paul says this is the characterization of his ministry. By the way, Paul's importance here, it does not lie in his ability and it does not lie in his personality. Listen, Paul's importance here lies in his identity. And my friends, yours does too. You will never figure out what you should do for Christ until you first figure out who you are in Christ. If you wake up every day and you're asking yourself, well, I don't really know who I am, I don't really know what I'm here for, then you're going to live a life that is all over the place. But if you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, who am I? I am God's servant and Jesus' missionary, that'll change the way you live. 
understand your identity. That's where Paul starts. I was recruited. I was enlisted by God for this job. Now, why? What, what is he going to do? Look what he says there. A bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for, this is where it starts to get tricky, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth. Now, that little word for there, again, there's no verb. That's what makes it hard. But, but, but it's kind of assumed. When he says for, he's saying, here is my purpose as an apostle and as God's servant. My purpose is, is, is for, it's to help others. It's for the sake of others. It's in order to, 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 to boost others. Now, who are the others here? He says, I'm an apostle, I'm a servant and an apostle for the faith of those chosen of God. Some of your translations say here, for God's elect. That is a very Old Testament term again that was used of Israel. That of all the nations, Israel was a special nation and they were chosen of God. They were God's elect people. And so now in the New Testament, Paul uses that term as a reference to the church To God's people, he's saying that the church is made up of men and women who are chosen to be recipients of God's grace. And he says, my ministry as an apostle and as a servant is not for me, it's not for the sake of building my ministry, it is for the sake of the church. It is for the sake of others. It is for the sake of those men and women of faith that God has called unto himself. And he says here, the the way I go about doing this, notice, he says, my ministry is for, look at your Bible, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth. So Paul's ministry is a servant and an apostle. And he's a servant and apostle for the benefit of others, those that are chosen of God, God's elect. And he says, "My, my responsibility to them is to help them in two specific areas. Their faith, And what? Their knowledge of the truth. Paul says that's the goal of my ministry is to help the church, to help others in their faith and in their knowledge of the truth. Those two are not the same thing, but they need one another. My friends, it is one thing to know the Bible. It is quite another thing to believe the Bible. You can have knowledge and not have faith. And if you have faith, you will inevitably have knowledge because you have to have faith in something. So the two go together. And Paul says, that's my task. It's to help God's children have faith and to have knowledge. And we still need both. Despite what some people seem to think, Christianity is not an anti-intellectual religion. Christianity is not about having faith versus reason. It is about having a reasonable faith. A knowledgeable faith. A faith that is informed by knowledge, and not just knowledge, but knowledge of of the truth. Not knowledge of myths, not knowledge of of fanciful things, but knowledge of actual facts and history. And he says here, those who have this knowledge and have this faith, they they are the ones I'm, I'm here to help. And notice, when God's children have faith and knowledge, notice where it winds up at the end of verse 1, which is according to godliness in other words this is the result so god's children who have faith and knowledge that paul has kind of provoked them in they have faith and knowledge if they really have faith and they really have knowledge it is going to result in what godliness it's going to produce a certain kind of these beliefs will result in a certain kind of behavior my friends you can claim to believe the truth but it really is of no account if it doesn't change your life a profession of faith that does not result in godliness is a false profession of faith i can say it much simpler for you to remember children can remember this those who look to Christ will look like Christ. Paul says, that's my ministry. Is to help the men and women who, who say they are looking to Christ is to also make sure that they look like Christ. And guess what? Just as a spoiler alert, the Cretans don't look like Christ. That's why he starts here. He's 
pushing back at them and saying, you know, all these rules I'm about to give you. It's not just because I'm giving you, I'm, I'm trying to show you this is the way that a person lives. If you're follow, if you look to Christ, you're going to look like him. And here's what it is to look like Christ. And so he spells it out later in the book. But Paul says, this is my whole ministry. It, God enlisted me. He recruited me to help and to, to spur on, to benefit, to boost the overall devotion of God's church. What Paul does here for the churches is a lot like what the USO does for our armed forces. Wherever there are troops, the USO shows up and and sees where they're at. And they don't just show there to entertain them. They're there to encourage them. They're there to remind them of what they're fighting for. They're there to, to make sure that they can do their job well. And Paul says, I've been enlisted for this task to go wherever there are troops in that sense, churches, to make sure that their faith is boosted and they're not deceiving themselves in some kind of misunderstanding here. Paul says his ministry was to boost the Christian devotion of others. Now listen to me. You may not be an apostle, but you have this same obligation. If I can say it this way, the answer to Cain's question is yes, you are your brother's keeper. Listen, this is one thing that we really struggle with as Americans, and I'll be honest, it is very tempting to compartmentalize and individualize our faith. But what the Bible calls us to is not just to look out for our own Christian devotion, it is to look out for the Christian devotion of others. To our brothers and sisters. It's not being nosy to ask your brother and sister, are you growing in knowledge? Are you reading your Bible? Are you trusting God and His promises? I know things are hard right now, but are you doing that? Paul says that that was the point of his ministry. And every one of us can do that. Maybe we're not an apostle, but, but we could very well identify ourselves and say, you know, here's who I am. I'm a I'm a father and I'm a husband, and and I've been enlisted by God to help my wife and children in their faith and knowledge in godliness. Maybe you're not an apostle or a missionary, but as a Christian at this business, I have a, a responsibility to identify the Christians around me and to boost them, to encourage them in their faith and their knowledge and their godliness. Yes, we should have an interest in our own spiritual health, but we should also have an active interest in the spiritual health of of others. We don't just, we're not just called to be disciples, we're called to make disciples. And Paul says that's, that's, that's what God enlisted him to do. So that's where it starts. So this is what God's doing. He's enlisting people, inviting people, calling people out and saying, your job is to help others. Help the faith of others, the knowledge of others to help boost them and grow in their devotion and in their obedience and their godliness. So the question is, are we doing that? Are you doing that? Have you seen yourself as having been drafted by God for this purpose? Paul says, I have, and we should too. So that's the first thing that God's doing in our world. He's he's enlisting servants for this purpose. Notice, secondly, in verse 2, God wants the church's devotion to be motivated by his life promise. All right, so he's enlisted servants like Paul, and their job is to to help boost our devotion. And now Paul's going to say, but you know, sometimes, isn't it hard to have Christian devotion? It's okay to admit it. We're in church. You could be honest in church. Isn't it hard sometimes to read your Bible and to grow in knowledge? Isn't it hard sometimes to really trust God when things look so abysmal and it's hard to have faith? And so Paul says, one of the ways that I really do this is by motivating people, verse 2, in the hope of eternal life. So so Paul says this, this is the foundation from which we really help those around us is to remind them and to to push them and to speak to them about the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So he said the church needs to have this devotion, knowledge and faith and godliness. And when they do that, it's, it's, but they need to be motivated by the right way. See, sometimes our faith and our knowledge are motivated in the wrong way. 
we, we do our devotions just to check it off the list and to feel self-righteous. That is a wrong motivation. We, 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 we do this or we do that so that God will accept us. No, 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 there's nothing we can do to make God accept us. And so Paul says here, if you're going to do these things, be sure you're doing it out of the right motivation. And what is the right motivation? It is in the hope of eternal life. It is not just wishful thinking, this word hope here. This is an earnest yearning, a confident expectation. This is what your dog does at 6 o'clock when he sits by his food bowl waiting for you. He's there. Why? Because he knows that you love him. He knows that you do this regularly. And so he, he's not just crossing his paws hoping you show up. It's confident expectation. This is what my master does. And so Paul says here, if you're going to press on in your devotion, do it because you're motivated. You, you understand the hope that we have is the hope of eternal life. My friends, the reason we should have Christian devotion today is because we will have eternal life one day. Paul says, you, you're in the midst of the toil and the struggle that is faith and knowledge, and we're trying to understand this Bible verse, and we're trying to believe God, and it's all so tough and difficult, and I'm, I'm not feeling as godly, not looking as godly as I should, and people come around trying to help us, and I go, I know I understand, I should be doing that. And Paul says, as you're struggling with this, you need to stop and remember why you're doing it. Look beyond your circumstances and remember the hope that you have. Let that be your motivation. It's the hope of eternal life. Survival experts will tell you that a man stranded in the woods, he is in trouble when he loses food or when he loses water or when he loses shelter, but he is in the deepest trouble when he loses hope. Why does he build a fire in hope? Why does he walk through the snow and get blisters on his feet in hope. Hope is what pushes his home, on him on. Hope is what propels him forward. And Paul says that's the same thing in the Christian life. Our devotion rests upon the hope of eternal life. And the hope of eternal life, notice verse 2, rests on what? The promises of God. And the character of God. This hope which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Now, what's interesting here, Paul is pushing back against, the, again, the, the society of Crete. Now, remember, Crete is a pagan society, and many of their gods were like the, the do you, um, they, they were pagan deities. You remember in high school reading, like, Greek mythology and Roman mythology? Like, I remember reading that thinking, these are pretty lousy gods, right? They lie and cheat and steal and do all kinds of stuff that's like, they're pretty corrupt. Why would you think they're gods, right? But that's what pagan, that's what pagan religion is. Look, if pagan religion teaches you anything, listen, it teaches you this. It teaches you there are many gods and they can't be trusted. Knowing that, Paul in verse 2 comes along and says, listen, if Christianity teaches you anything, it teaches you this. There's one God and he can be trusted. He is the God who cannot, it doesn't say he will not lie or he should not lie. He said he cannot lie. It is against his very nature. To, to call God a liar is like calling yourself a meat-eating vegetarian. It makes no sense. You, you, like, it's impossible. And so he says here, no, no, our, this is the character of our God. He cannot lie. And so when he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. And so Paul says here, understand that as you push forward in your faith, that's what we're pushing forward to. God has made promises to us, and, and in our knowledgeable faith, we're knowledgeable of the truth, the truth of God's promises. That propels us. It gives us hope that everything He said will be true, and so we press on in our devotion and in our godliness. In, in a lot of books and movies, there's a, a, there's a proven way to dupe your audience. You've all seen movies like this where you watch a movie, and you get like three quarters of the way through, and you go, Whoa! And the whole movie seems to change. It's like, that's not what I thought it was, you know. In literature or in movies, it's called, that's called an unreliable narrator. Right? The person telling the story is not really telling you the whole story. You're only seeing part of it. You ever saw A Beautiful Mind I mean, years ago? Like that was the, you get to a point in the movie and you go, oh, he's crazy. Like, you like understand all of a sudden why it all makes sense that way, right? Paul's point in verse 2 is, listen, 
God is the ultimate reliable narrator. We don't know about death, what lies beyond it, but God is a narrator and he's told us what's out there. We don't know where everything came from. We weren't there, but God is the narrator. He's told us where it came from. And he told us that long before he even created it all, he made a promise and the promise was the hope of eternal life. And if we come the way that he has said and we pursue that, that is what will be our reward. That's our confidence. Hell is a good reason to start trusting Christ, but heaven is the best reason to keep on trusting Christ. The the Christian life should not primarily be motivated by the fear of eternal death. It should be motivated by the hope of eternal life. Paul says that's what pushes us on. So listen, what's Paul's point here? Your everyday life should be rearranged around your eternal life. Why should you open up your Bible on Monday morning and start in God's presence? Because one day you're going to start every day in God's presence. That's his point. And you look forward to what God's promised and you live today in light of that. And we're motivated, not out of some obligation like, well, I better do these things or God's going to get mad or I got to do these things so I'll, I'll go to heaven. No, those are all wrong motivations. That's a false gospel. A true gospel says we come by faith in Christ and we live by faith, faith in the promises of God. And we're motivated. There's another thing God's doing in verse 3. So this life promise, we learn in verse 3 that God is revealing his life promise through biblical preaching. God is revealing his life promise through biblical preaching. So God made a promise, the promise of life, right? And look at the end of verse 2. He says he promised it long ages ago, right? A long time ago God made this promise. And so Paul says this is the promise that motivates us. But he makes clear in verse 3, we always didn't know this. Verse 3 says, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. So two and three are are totally linked. He says, what propels us is the hope of life. And God promised that eternal life to us a long time ago. And when he made that promise, at first that promise was a secret. Shh, he didn't tell anybody everything. God's people knew he was up to something. If you read the Old Testament, they're trying to figure it out, but they didn't quite get the full picture. And so God sort of keep it hidden, and he was slowly revealing some stuff through the law and through the prophets and so on and so forth. And then finally, when Jesus comes, he dies and he rises again, and the apostles are sent out. And at that point, his word is the clarity. It's the clarifying point when God made known the message. And now he says, we we have this message and it's been revealed to us in his word. So this book right here, and that's why Paul says it's our job to proclaim it. He says, this is one thing that God is doing. He's revealing this promise through biblical preaching. Some of you know the name Harper Lee. She wrote the classic To Kill a Mockingbird. You may also know that last year, a, a, a new book was published by her. But the book was written something like 60 years ago. Go set a watchman. She wrote the book before To Kill a Mockingbird, but her publisher didn't like it, so she sort of put it away. And it was thought to have been lost, but her lawyer back in, I think, 2013 found it in a lockbox, pulled it out, started reading it, and went, wow, what is this? And through various agents and so forth, they went through all the litigations necessary. And last year in 2015, that, that work was finally published. It was written a long time ago, but now everybody has access to it. That's what Paul says about God's promise of life. God made the promise a long time ago, and we always didn't know what it was. The Old Testament was a little bit confused. But now, because of what we have in the Word, the, the, God's published it. And it's available to everybody, and it should be proclaimed to everybody. He says it is in the proclamation that we are entrusted. This is why we should take an active interest. Not every one of us is called to be a formal preacher, but every one of us should have a vested interest in preaching. This is why we should pray for our seminaries, that the professors and the students teach and learn how to properly proclaim the Word. 
because it's only through the word that the promise, the life promise is revealed. This is one of the things that irks me, and, 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 and I'll be nice, irks me about people's modern notions of what preaching is. People say, well, I want a preacher who like, you know, makes me feel good or you know, helps my marriage or whatever. Like, I'm cool with all that. I get all that stuff. But listen, my job is not to be your life coach and your therapist. My job is to point you to the hope that lies beyond this world. And if you get a firm grasp on that, it will totally help your marriage and your children and everything else. But if I just put a Band-Aid on your, your issues, that's not going to help you in the long run. Paul said it is the proclamation of the gospel, of this good news that changes and shapes us, and that's what we should be about. And the, the fact of the matter is, he says, this was hidden in days past, and my friends, guess what? For many people in our world today, God's life promise is still hidden, and it needs to be revealed to them. This is why we still need to send missionaries around the world. But listen, this life promise needs to be revealed to people around the world. It also needs to be revealed to people sitting around our dinner table. A couple nights ago, we were sitting at home, and one of my youngest sons, he said, Hey, Daddy, he said, uh, he said, how do you go to heaven? And I said, what do you think? And he thought about it for a second, and he said, Be good? And before I could answer, one of my older children, who's a very compassionate evangelist, said, No, you have to trust in Jesus, dummy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't encourage insult evangelism. Like That's probably not a good approach to, to, to reaching people. What's my point? My, listen, some of you moms and dads, your children, the message of the gospel is still veiled to their understanding. It's your job to reveal it. You don't have to preach a sermon in the way that Paul says. His point is just the revealing of it. There are people in our neighborhoods, they still don't know this gospel. And it is our job to make known God's life promise and declare to them God's word. Spurgeon said, some men may preach the gospel better, but no man preaches a better gospel. This is what we proclaim. Listen, we live in a world right now that is so depressed and our world is sad and our world is scared and our world is fearful and Paul says we get to stand up and say, hey, guess what? There's hope. Guess what? There's something beyond this. Guess what? There's good news. We get to stand up and proclaim to the world that this isn't all there is. God, the very God who's created all things, He's came into this world and He made a promise to us that those who trust in Him by faith will be saved and have life and will have knowledge and will grow in godliness and your world will never be the same again. And Paul says this is what was entrusted to him. So what's, what's the end here, verse 4? One last thing God's doing, I think, in this passage. We see in verse 4 that God entrusts His work to each new generation. God entrusts his work to each new generation. So we have to ask ourselves, God's enlisting servants, are we willing to be one of those servants? God is motivating people and wants us to be motivated by the right way. Are we being motivated by the right truth? God wants the message to be revealed to others. Are we doing our part to help that happen? And now we learn in verse 4 that God is entrusting this whole work to the next generation. Again, verse 4 seems very simple to Titus. But crammed, look, remember, it's Paul dot, dot, dot to Titus. What's the dot, dot, dot? Paul is in essence saying, listen, this is what God's doing in the world. And as a result, this is what I'm doing in the world. And Titus, I'm passing the baton onto you. This is what you're going to do at Crete. God's got this big grand plan and I'm doing my part throughout the Mediterranean world and I want you in that one local church to make sure that it happens. We may not be regional global missionaries and we may not even pastor a local church or, or have that kind of role, but listen, we have our little space, be it in our families, be it in our Sunday school classes, be it with those around us. We have our place to do this. And we have an obligation, church, to be sure we're passing it on to the next generation. Paul could not be everywhere and do everything, so he needed to raise up a Titus to continue. He calls him my true child in the faith. Remember, 
In the ancient world, fathers often passed along their work or their trade to their sons. That's sort of what's happening here. Paul says, the family business is building the church's devotion. And Titus, I'm asking you to do that in Crete. You're my son. You're going to continue this work and keep this going. He calls him his son, his child, in a common faith. By the way, that was a radical claim to say it was a common faith because remember, Paul is what? Paul is Jewish. Titus is Gentile. It's not like there's the Jewish ministry and there's the Gentile ministry, so we better keep these things really divided because they're so very, very different. Paul says, no, no, it's a, it's a common faith. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity may be. It doesn't matter what your skin color may be. He says here, it's a, it's a common faith to all people. There's no second-class citizens in this sense. Titus, who is the uncircumcised Gentile, is still a, a brother in Christ, and so the two of us work together towards this end. And to complete this task, he knows that he needs grace and he needs peace. He needs the very presence of God to propel him forward. So, so where we wind up in verse 4 is this realization that what God gave to Paul... Paul gave to Titus, Titus was to give to Crete, the Cretans were to give to others, and my friends, it has now been given to us. And guess what? Spoiler alert, we're not going to live forever. So we must entrust this to the next generation. I hear people often say, man, I just wish Billy Graham would preach again. I understand that feeling. But every generation has had its Billy Graham and the next one might be in our 7th grade youth ministry right now. Instead of just thinking about what was, let's work towards what God is doing and be sure that we're passing on to every generation what God has done. Our work may seem small. Our work may seem insignificant. My friends, it is part of God's work and it's never small and it is never insignificant. May we press on towards that end. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this introduction to the book of Titus. Though it is complex at first glance, we realize the rich truth that we have here. Thank you, God, for who you are and what you're doing. And may we understand who we are and what we're doing in light of you. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know Christ... I pray that they will understand as Paul ends that, that, that opening there that he is our God and Savior and that they would trust him today and that your people would grow in faith and knowledge and godliness for the sake of those around us. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.